organizations need diversity of thought. They need to include youth from different backgrounds in order to maximize their own potentials. And this is not just because it's the right thing to do, but it actually makes sense from an economic perspective. Welcome to Redefiners, a podcast designed for daring leaders who are changing what it means to lead in today's increasingly complex world. I'm Nanas Motoshami, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates. And I'm Clark Murphy, Chief Executive Officer. Nanas and I have spent our careers exploring what works and what's next in the realm of leadership. In each episode, we ask our guests deep and provocative questions about how they've challenged the norms and how they've redefined their organizations and ultimately themselves as leaders. All so you can answer this one question. How are you redefining your leadership? Perhaps the boldest question yet. Conversations that matter. Inspiration for us all, whether you're kicking off your career or crafting your legacy. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive in. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. Today, we're going to talk with an incredible young leader who is working to help the next generation of leaders. Um, Clark, I am so excited to talk to him and hear how he is empowering today's youth. And actually, I'm really fascinated to hear his perspective on how Gen Z thinks, on how we can best motivate themselves as they enter the workforce. It's it's a conversation that I find I'm having quite often with um, some of my senior clients. I got to say, I'm the opposite. I'm totally intimidated. We've had CEOs and chair people and female leaders on this podcast, and we've got a 30 under 30 who's lived in Africa, is closer to the Gen Z than you or I are, except for our children telling us what we're doing wrong. Uh, so I'm, I'm fascinated to learn from them. I'm also a little intimidated, I got to say. So Clark, who are we meeting today? Our guest today is Tahab Bawa. Uh, co-founder and CEO of Goodwall. Goodwall is a social network platform that connects basically Gen Z teenage students, university students, and young professionals with scholarships, internships, job opportunities, and actually each other. Taha has lived uh, around the world, truly a global citizen, studied at Oxford and HSA Lausanne. He's been included in several top leader lists like the Forbes 30 Under 30, entrepreneurs, 15 entrepreneurs under 30 to watch out for, uh, he's a speaker on education and innovation at TEDx, at the United Nations, Google Business Talks, MIT, Oxford, and many others. Um, we are we are really excited uh, that Tawa is joining us today. That is an awful lot of achievements under the age of 30. I am also intimidated. Taha, thank you for joining us on Redefiners. Thank you so much for having me. Taha, there's a lot to talk about. Um, Why don't I actually start uh, with a question about you? Um, and how you got to where you are today. So if I'm not mistaken, you actually wanted to start life as a cricketer um, when, when you were a child. Yes, um, I, I learned very, very quickly that um, cricket or, or any sport for that matter was not really um, my way forward. I, I'm very happy watching from the sidelines and playing amateurly. Goodwall was my, my brother's idea initially. We realized, he realized, we realized that we were very fortunate to have the opportunities growing up that are really the only reason why I'm on this call with you today. We thought if we could give millions of other people, particularly youth, you know, being able to impact them in that very formative stage, opportunities not just within the classroom, where a lot of emphasis is, but really outside of the classroom, which we thought was the differentiating element for us, then not only could we help them maximize their potential, but also help millions of youth potentially have a positive impact on society. Would love to talk more about sure. Goodwill, but before we get there, did you not have, and, and I say this as a mum of a Gen Zer, as well as a stepmom to three um, other Gen Zers, did you not have pressure from your parents to go and do something more mainstream? Become a banker, become a consultant, dare I say become a lawyer. What was it in you that kind of felt that you had to do something that was purpose-driven? Yeah, uh, my brother studied law and I studied economics. Okay. So um, if I, uh, you know, if I hadn't done this, well, uh, most of my friends ended up in finance and consulting. I was interviewing uh, for asset management jobs. My only internship was at Christie's, the art auction house, because I was at the time I was very interested in art. I'd studied it on the side, and I was actually trying to build a platform that sold art online. In the end, my experience made it such that I followed my brother into his venture. And Taha, you talk about um, 
with honesty, great education, uh, great people, great friends, uh, initial jobs. What's your redefining moment? Like, what's that moment that you think is really pivoted to help you be the leader you are today? I think for me in university to go to be alongside incredibly intelligent, incredibly mindful people, but realizing that we had very different objectives in life. And my reason or my purpose comes from the experiences that I grew up with. We were brought up, we grew up in various countries around the world, but we visited refugee camps over our summers. And uh, as a 10-year-old giving sweets to kids who are your age and then being super grateful for it, you say, why? You know, that doesn't really make sense. I don't think anyone could say that I had done more than another 10-year-old. It was just luck. So it's like, we have to leverage the opportunities we've been given to create something bigger than ourselves. I love that story. Thank you. And it does give me food for thought as it comes to my own nine-year-old and making him realize how lucky he is. It starts as early as that 10-year-old experience that really sticks with me till today. And I really think about it a lot. But that continues because we travel and we see the discrepancy, just the unleveled playing field, if you would, that exists. And um, that's a constant reminder Organizations need diversity of thought. They need to include youth from different backgrounds in order to maximize their own potentials. And if we talk about some of the existential problems that our society faces, we need to have a representative audience. It cannot just be a percentage of the populace. And this is not just because it's the right thing to do, but it actually makes sense from an economic perspective. So let's talk about Goodwill then, please. I am naive. Can you help sort of explain to me and maybe some of our other listeners how does it work? What's the difference, for example, being very simplistic between Goodwall and LinkedIn? How do you help the underprivileged? So Goodwall is a mobile first platform that essentially helps youth age 14 to 24, high school to graduates in showcasing who they are in terms of their extracurricular and academic achievements based on what we call the skills graph, connect them to the right opportunities at the right time. So internships, scholarships, college opportunities, first jobs, all of this within a safe, positive, encouraging environment, such that they find help for certain problems they have, but also a tribe that can encourage them along their way, which they may not have around them at school or at college. Uh, in terms of what really differentiates it from a LinkedIn or other platforms, uh, LinkedIn is incredibly good at matching people who have a resume, who have certain past experiences, and one can extrapolate from those experiences to match them with other opportunities. Youth, particularly underprivileged youth, do not have those experiences and do not have much of a resume. And so we run virtual online pathway programs that scale to hundreds of thousands of youth around the world alongside governments, foundations, corporates, to really help youth develop skills, but also showcase who they are. But was it hard to get the corporates, the governments, the foundations on board? Or once you describe the concept, it, it, you know, they, they, they saw the benefits and they saw that they needed this diversity of thought. I would always like it to be easier. But no, we've been quite privileged to have a lot of corporates, governments, foundations come on board, not only because it is the right thing to do, but because it makes economic sense. On the governmental side, it's about empowering their populations. It's about countering the migration crisis that's around the corner in Europe, for example. If we take youth from certain underprivileged areas or economies that have structural problems, they have a huge youth demographic. If this is not solved for, there will be a migration problem. Our problems are interdependent and global. Um, mm. And then when we think about talent from a corporate perspective, it's not just talent, it's also marketing. It's about moving from storytelling to story doing. My 25-year-old daughter works for a Fortune 50 company. She's two years into the job. A year into the job, she is a, is a newbie with 100,000 employees, starts pounding the table saying, this company has got to be more purpose-driven. She pounds the table long enough and loud enough that eventually, in the second year, her second year working there, she's now anchoring the town hall every time for the company to revisit their journey as a purpose-driven company, which one would have thought would have arrived maybe five years ago. Uh, and she's reverse mentoring some of the senior executives in the company. Um, how do you attract and retain Gen Z employees? Because we know they, 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 they will walk with their feet if they're, they don't believe it's authentic. What's your point of view on this? I think you, you nailed it. It's, it's authenticity. And so if we talk about purpose, 
you know, most Fortune 500 companies have amazing mission statements and amazing value statements on their, on their landing pages, on their employer branding pages. But if it is not authentic, if at the end of the day, it is not shown in terms of how they treat their employees, not just their C-suite, it's how they do business in terms of engaging with their stakeholders, whether it be environmental, whether it be supply chain, whether it be how they market to consumers, how they engage with consumers. It's again, doing rather than telling. And I think it's pretty easy now for this demographic in particular to see past the telling. I remember talking about this with a friend's father from a large energy group. And I said, I would love to come work for your company. It seems like you're doing so much in sustainability. And he said at the time, Ta, please don't. It's only big enough. Uh, the work we're doing, which was uh, plastered, all, you know, two pages economist for a year, is only big enough for it to show up on our balance sheet. Uh, that, that might have been good enough at the time, but today people see through it. And Tava, how much of that tone should be set by the CEO themselves? So, you know, there are some CEOs um, that I work with who are very vocal on topics like climate change or social justice. And there are others who, you know, quite frankly, maybe because they are from a different generation, feel somewhat uncomfortable that, you know, there might be a backlash or th th there might be some risk associated to it. Does that authenticity, does it need to stem from the CEO? I mean, you yourself are a very vocal CEO. Well, what's the role in the CEO on all of this? I think that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I, I have friends who are CEOs of large groups who actually told me, I don't understand when my kids talk to me about this topic. I really don't understand. Yeah. Then it's about learning. And there are various networks, I assume, including yours and others, that they can learn from, educate oneself. I think that's the responsibility of the CEO to understand. This is a problem that is not going away and it is critical to their constituents, employees, future employees, customers, um, and maybe even the existence of their business in some cases. And as a second step, if they believe, and they most likely will if they do understand, then they can choose whether or not to be vocal. I think being vocal without understanding, then again, you have that disconnect of authenticity. Yeah. We pivot to, to UNICEF in Africa. Uh, Taha, you lived in Africa. You, you, have, you have the personal experience of being there. Tell us about some of the uh, challenges and opportunities that youth in Africa face. How can Goodwall help facilitate, translate, what, when you step back from it, how do you, how do you look at Goodwall in Africa? There, there's so much opportunity, but there are enormous challenges. Basically, across the continent, you have economies that are structurally frail compared to certain developed countries such as Switzerland. So that is the context within which they live. Having said that, it's a young population that is super vibrant. Of course, I'm generalizing here. And you know, when we talk about Africa, there are regions, there are countries, there are sub-regions within countries. But as a whole, if we're to simplify, say, there's an incredibly motivated, young, hungry demographic that wants to improve their lives. So much in the battle or the, the fight against climate change must be done in Africa, given the amount of green land that still exists, the biodiversity that still exists, that just frankly does not exist in Europe or in the US anymore. In terms of what we can do to help, I think it's about connecting them to remote jobs, connecting them to virtual pathway programs, connecting them to side hustles. Um, side hustles can be video content creation that can be leveraged anywhere. It could be script writing, it could be uh, social media. But I think if we look at impacting as much of that youth population as possible, there's so much to be done in side hustling, alternative livelihoods, and then accessing virtual opportunities. Gen Z is the first truly digital native generation. We're seeing African youth, who many of whom, not all of whom by far, are connected to the world. How does the digital native impact, enable or not, uh, this discussion? Definitely. I, uh, the connectivity is growing on a week-to-week -week basis, really. And as you said, they are digitally native. So they're, at times, more proficient. When it comes from something as, as simple as data entry all the way to something as maybe complex as video production, they're maybe more proficient than certain experts from the generation above. And there still is a lot of work to be done on the continent, uh, but not just on the continent, but in the global south on connectivity. But we really see you know, almost week to week, that improvement happening. Of course, there's problems with the prices of data packages and others, but they can be offset through opportunity. So how do you see more young people going maybe the entrepreneurial route versus 
kind of tr the traditional job market. H has that changed how Goodwill is helping the youth? So on our side, what we've seen take off, uh, particularly these virtual pathway programs. So they can be on entrepreneurial thinking. I think entrepreneurship is the idea of starting a company is often overestimated or the value of it is over, uh, overestimated. Joining a company is even more important. I don't know if you've seen that TED video of how to create a movement. So you, you, know, you always have that crazy person that starts it, but what you really need to make a success are those followers that make it a movement. We have multi-generational companies that are quite small. They need entrepreneurial thinking to be able to reinvent themselves. But if we take the largest Fortune 500 companies, uh, what do they need? Well, they need that entrepreneurial thinking as well because they are going to have to reinvent themselves and adapt to the fact that their industry may completely collapse in the next five, 10 years or the way they do business changes. You are spot on. And, and actually, if I think of us, Russell Reynolds, um, a lot of the younger researchers that we have, we lose them, you know, 10 years ago, we may have lost them to competitors. We're actually increasingly losing them to join smaller companies, to join startups, which, you know, great for them. But to your point, we're then missing that entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so I think what you say are wise words for many established companies. Yeah. We'll be right back with Taha in a moment. But first, we're going to take a quick break to hear some new research insights from Joe Gorey, a managing director with Russell Reynolds Associates in New York. Digital technologies are reshaping how humans live and work, affecting everything from individuals to society to the global economy. They're having positive impacts and negative ones, too, because adapting to this much technological change so rapidly can be disruptive and bring unexpected and unanticipated challenges. But here's where opportunity comes in. As technology has become the heartbeat of organizations, leaders are thinking about their technological social responsibility, or TSR. Like corporate social responsibility, TSR considers the impact that technology has on all stakeholders, employees, customers, communities, even the world. It's about balancing responsibility and growth to create alignment between short and medium term business goals and longer term societal ones. Impact happens when the TSR is embedded into the fabric of the business by the board, the C-suite, and the customer. Bottom line, technology's impact can be both positive and negative. And it's a leader's responsibility to figure out how to maximize the positive outcomes and minimize the negative ones. To learn more about technology and transformation, go to russellreynolds.com slash insights. And now back to our conversation with Taha. Let's talk a little bit about sustainability. And look, I will put my hands up and say I was one of those people who didn't quite understand, um, you know, post-pandemic, I've had 18 months of living with the Gen Zers who have made me understand. Um, and I see from their point of view, look, that they they are, if I can generalize, they are somewhat cynical, rightly so, because um, the world has not been left in the best sort of situation from a climate, a climate perspective, um, in terms of so social justice perspective by the generations before them. Um, so, you know, that the, the ethically and morally very serious, somewhat cynical, somewhat skeptical. Do you think that there's any way that we can, you know, turn that into optimism, that turn their frustration into hope and change? I think you know, there's reason for that frustration, as you mentioned. It's definitely suboptimal. And they've gone through a generational challenge. You know, a lot of them have had to be at home, lots of interruptions, an already anxiety-inducing period was just so much more uh, difficult. Having said that, I think they might be known, they may be known as the resilient generation. If we support them appropriately over the next years, and it's critical we do, and when you say we, yeah. corporations, government, um, foundations, civil society, if we support them the right way, they can one day be known as a resilient generation that not only thrives in their own careers, but actually leverages their experiences that they've had to go through to help tackle some of the existential problems we face, such as climate change. Because it is going to require a special set of 
resilience and, and adaptability and ingenuity to be able to tackle such a large problem. It's about having that diversity of thought and a true representation when we talk about a problem like climate change. Because if there's one thing we've learned from the COVID crisis is that we are interdependent. We need global solutions. It cannot be represented from just a small subsection of society that have gone to the same universities and and lived in the same places. We need that representation. And if they are being represented, they need to know. And that's one of the things we're doing is we're helping train youth from around the world to be able to speak at a policy level with CEOs. And then once they are able to have that conversation, well, they must be listened to. Mm. Listened to such that there isn't this disconnect and this increased polarization between generations, rather that they're collaborating and leveraging each other's strengths. You, know, you talk about the, the, being the resilient generation. Youth have had more social isolation in the last 18 months due to this pandemic than, than anyone has faced um, ever, really. And mental health has become a concern because of that isolation. What do you doing to help youth with mental health? What, how do you think about mental health before and now, certainly given, given all we've been through? That isolation, while still being connected through these social networks, through these platforms where everyone's life is inevitably, even during a pandemic, better than yours, uh, there's so much additional pressure, so much content, so much misinformation uh, that one is almost numb to it. How do, they, how do they react to that? I don't think we've even understood really the full consequences of this. We may only find out in a few years to come, but we must be proactive. What we're doing internal to our company, where we do have various Gen Zers working, is there are incredible tools now, digitally enabled tools that provide cost-effective mental health support. Now, that can be in the form of role modeling, that can be in the form of inspirational talks, that can be in the form of having peer-to-peer connections, because you can't always have a connection with a professional. Um, But all of that contributes to solving or at least alleviating some of the pain. But it's a real problem. And I think uh, we need a concerted, multi-stakeholder approach to that. Mm. We're seeing the the world awakening to mental health pressures. And and I think the, the Gen Z world of Instagram, where everybody's happy and there's always a beautiful sunset, uh, is actually reinforcing some of these issues that, oh my gosh, my life is not perfect. And I'm just, I think our approach uh, at, at Russell Reynolds is to say, we need to talk. Come talk. Let's talk. And there's a whole lot of opportunities for anyone you want to talk to, but we got we to gotta open the door here um, for sure. Mental health has been an issue that's been a part of society. Maybe we didn't necessarily recognize it as being there. Um, Today, we do realize that people are going through this. Having said that, uh, this generation has definitely been facing that in in, in a way that probably hasn't been felt before in a long time. So your parents talked to you about IQ, and we have grown up, the boomers have talked about EQ and the ability to understand people. We think the, the leadership now and tomorrow will be defined by their LQ, their learning quotient. Will they be able to remember how to learn? Will they keep learning? Because, you know, we've interviewed people about executing for results and decisiveness and all these kind of traditional uh, competencies. And now it's about how well you deal with ambiguity. Are you agile enough to keep moving in a rapidly changing world? Uh, And the LQ, I think, will define institutional culture, will define leadership success uh, and, and, and define even the, the next gen. We all have got to learn how to relearn. Just pulling on that thread a little bit, um, Taha, as we think about that entrepreneurial spirit, that join the movement, create the movement, um, what skills do you think these next gen leaders are going to need to develop in order to be successful? We, we have the passion, the authenticity, the digitization, et cetera, what else do they need? And what would be your advice? Probably, and this is not just the next gen, I think this is our entire society um, as a whole. If we think of older members of society that are going to have to reinvent themselves, I will have to reinvent myself. We all have to reinvent ourselves. I think learning how to learn is really probably the most, the most important thing. Yeah. We don't necessarily know or I don't know what skills will be needed in five years or seven years or 20 or 30. But I think there's a very good chance that it is not the skills that we are asking people to learn today. And with that in mind, 
being able to learn how to learn is so important. And even if they are the skills that are needed, their industry may be destroyed or their competition might eliminate them. And so one might have to completely pick up and say, okay, we need to pivot and change the way we think. And that's, again, being comfortable learning, being curious. And from that, being resilient, being comfortable with failure is going to be critical. And I think that's really across society. Taha, I'm going to make a plug for one of our episodes. Uh, We recently recorded an episode with uh, Jim Snabe, who is... um, Amongst many accolades that he has, he's the chairman of Siemens um, AG and Maersk. And he says exactly, he's a very different generation from you. He's had a very different uh, set of experiences, but he says exactly what you have said, the need to constantly reinvent oneself and reinvent oneself from a position of strength. Um, So do listen to that. I definitely will. So I'm officially middle-aged. Um, And obviously, kind of, it it makes me look back to when I was in my 20s and what advice I would give. Um, I think my generation, I'm Generation X, you know, we came after the baby boomers who were nothing but workaholics and we continued to work hard, but I think we played equally hard. Um, And so as I look back, I wish the advice someone had given me at the time was um, slow down, stop and live in the moment a bit more. Um, That's a very long-winded way of asking you, what advice would you give Gen Zers? Um, If you had to kind of look and project into the future, what wise words would you give them? I would say try and do what's best for you and then try and have an impact beyond yourself. It's incredibly rewarding as a feeling. But I think focusing on the moment, focusing on oneself helps drive long-term productivity. Because uh, one can work a lot of hours, but what is the productivity of those hours? And how sustainable is that? Mm-hmm. So, Ta, a question that many of us are struggling with in a hybrid or remote situation. Company cultures, joining a movement, creating a movement, which we talked about, um, comes from interconnectivity. You run a virtual company. How do you create, maintain culture in a virtual world with digital natives? Mm-hmm. There are tactics to be applied on a day-to-day basis virtually. Having said that, it it has its limits. I think it comes down to aligning on values and expectations at the forefront. So being clear, why are we here? What do we stand for? And what are our expectations from another? So being able to communicate on a day-to-day basis in an effective way. And then it's being clear, and though we are a virtual company, we're completely remote first, We are investing in meetups. We are investing in physical meetups. So not just virtual pizza uh, evenings, which we do do, but also physical meetups because it has been shown. I mean, the importance of that human connectivity in person, it's there. And as much as I would love to say, oh, we don't need it, we do. And so we take our rent money and we put it towards conferences, towards, uh, towards meetups, and really working towards building those deep connections of trust and, and of course, great ideas come out of it. We reinvent ourselves that way. Are you fed up with one size fits all life and business advice that never works or sounds too good to be true? Maybe you feel like you're hearing the same people saying the same thing on every podcast. Well, that's what makes Unmistakable Creative so different. They feature candid conversations with insanely interesting people. Get timeless wisdom, inspiring stories, practical advice from bank robbers, yep, bank robbers, billionaires, best-selling authors, and change makers. In addition to some of the usual suspects like Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin, Danielle Laporte, Kelly McGonigal, you'll discover thousands of interesting people from all walks of life who show you how to succeed on your terms. Listen to Unmistakable Creative wherever you get your podcasts. Taha, we are going to end with a set of rapid fire questions. Uh, We do this in every podcast episode. Um, So we will ask you a series of five questions and uh, please let us know what comes to mind. Um, First one, if you had the opportunity to work for anyone in your career, who would it be and why? Russell Reynolds. (laughs) (laughs) Good man. Uh, I knew I liked this guy. (laughs) Uh, and you didn't even have to think no, it came straight out I love no it. it was supernatural exactly okay so define what success means to you being the best version of myself if you could instantly become an expert in something what would it be oh tough uh, 
I dreamt of being a pure mathematician. If you could delete all but three apps from your mobile phone, what three would you keep? Tough. I guess, I guess WhatsApp uh, would be one. Safari Chrome, so internet browser would be the second, and then, and then phone. So we go back to the basics, right? Yeah. And then the last one for you, Taha. What's the one important skill that you think every person should have? Uh, adaptability. I was once told by a really intelligent gentleman that he was never the one to figure out the solution first, but he was normally quickest to find out when things weren't working. So being able to adapt, and that's what made him successful. I thought it was pretty cool. Thank you, Taha, for joining us in Redefiners. We appreciate it. Authenticity and purpose. If a company can't live up to authenticity or understanding purpose, they should own up to it. Gen Zs may actually be more proficient at many things, digital or non-digital, so leverage their ability and their proficiencies in any size company. Not everyone has to be part of a startup that joining up is as important as starting up and making it a movement. Our entrepreneurial thinking is part of reinvention. And to reinvent, some of us, been around longer than the Gen Z, might need to learn again how to learn. This ability to learn, the learning quotient as we call it. And respect the resilient generation because the problems they will take on, the agility they need, the resiliency that they will bring to climate change or social justice or technology or marketing, recognize that this resilient generation brings a great deal to the table and take all of it in at once. Some good lessons learned from Goodwall. Thanks for joining us on Redefiners. Thank you so much for having me, Clark and Nanaz. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Redefiners. For more dynamic insights from leaders from across industries and around the world, listen to Redefiners wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more or get in contact with us, visit our website at russellreynolds.com. Find us on LinkedIn and follow us on Twitter at RA on Leadership. See you next time.